Witamy Państwa bardzo serdecznie z namiotu Rzeczpospolitej na Forum Ekonomicznym w Karpaczu. Forum się jeszcze nie zaczęło, ale my już pracujemy i temat, pierwszy temat, który się pojawi u nas w formie debaty, dyskusji, a nawet prezentacji, to strategia na rzecz rozwiązania kryzysu politycznego na Białorusi. My nie jesteśmy, proszę Państwa, przesadnymi zwolennikami Władimira Putina oraz Aleksandra Łukaszenki, w związku z tym dajemy tutaj głos białoruskiej opozycji i ona będzie rozważać, jak rozwiązać problem polityczny na Białorusi. Wydaje się to oczywiście, proszę Państwa, trudne. Czy to w ogóle możliwe? Jak możliwe i kiedy? Białoruś jest w trudnej sytuacji. Po wyborach prezydenckich opozycja została spacyfikowana. Zasiliła bardzo mocno szeregi emigracji. Tam istnieją alternatywne władze, które dają jakąś perspektywę na przejęcie kontroli politycznej w jakimś skończonym czasie na Białorusi, ale na dodatek mamy jeszcze wojnę. Wojnę, która angażuje również, na razie pasywnie, ale jednak angażuje Białoruś. Jak sobie z tym wszystkim poradzić? Czy wojna może wspomóc procesy demokratyczne na Białorusi? O tym będziemy rozmawiali, proszę Państwa, z panem Walerem Cepkało. Dzień dobry. Były wiceminister spraw zagranicznych Białorusi, ambasador w Stanach Zjednoczonych, także biznesmen, kierownik białoruskiego High Tech Park, także kandydat, niezarejestrowany kandydat na prezydenta dziś w opozycji oraz pan Dmitri Bokunec, political analyst, czyli analik, analityk polityczny. Im oddaję głos, a potem proszę państwa pytania. Panie Walery, zaczynamy. Dzień. Dzień dobry Panie i Panowie. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, we would like really to thank Rzeczpospolita newspaper for this opportunity uh, to speak in front of you and uh, share our vision uh, how to overcome the current political crisis in Belarus. As you are all aware, uh, in 2020, uh, the presidential elections were completely corrupted by the by Lukashenko regime. Uh, and uh, several major contenders to the presidential post were detained or had to flee the country. So uh, when we are talking about the absence of the electoral process, then it means that uh, there are no uh, legitimate body now in our country, in the Republic of Belarus. The president doesn't recognize by anyone. It means that he is not the president. Uh, in terms of institution, in terms of legal institution. We do not have the recognized parliament uh, because uh, the parliament, uh, the, the members of the parliament are not those, the members of the parliament that are elected by the people, but those who are appointed by uh, Lukashenko himself. So uh, we do not have the uh, judicial uh, power as an independent uh, branch of powers. And uh, inside the country, we also do not have independent media uh, with the opportunity to speak uh, whatever they want to say or whatever corresponds to their views on the current development in the country. So uh, we face the major problem is the absence of the legitimacy of any branch of power in the Republic of Belarus. Um, so Lukashenko, in fact, I would uh, disagree that uh, with you, uh, you were saying that we are in opposition. I think that we are representative of uh, uh, democratic Belarus. It means that we represent the majority of Belarus people. We represent the desire of most of Belarus people to live in a democratic society. And there are quite a few number of people that really supports uh, uh, Lukashenko. Uh, besides the regime, besides law enforcement agencies, I think that he doesn't have a support among any social group in the Republic of uh, Belarus. Uh, so, um, uh, because uh, yesterday uh, we spoke with uh, Juan Guaido. Uh, um, 
Yesterday we spoke with Juan Guaido. Uh, you know that, well, some countries consider him as an elected president and uh, some country, uh, countries uh, do not recognize him as the president. But anyway, uh, he is uh, one of the uh, most recognizable uh, faces, I think, in the world. Uh, so he agreed to help us in our new initiative. And this initiative is to create the National Council of the Republic of Belarus that would be elected uh, by uh, Belarusian people. And uh, this National Council can serve as a prototype to the future parliament and can serve as an instrument during the transitional period in the Republic of uh, Belarus. Um, so um, you probably know, you definitely know, because uh, Belarus and Poland are neighbors, that uh, 28 years in power of the same person. And uh, you know, just we faces, uh, we face and we, we, we are witnesses of uh, many changes around the world. And if you can see uh, the presidents of the United States, they were several of them. And uh, we still, and probably uh, Biden will be reelected in 2024, we don't know. Um, yeah, otherwise it would be uh, quite a challenging thing. Uh, the uh, American politics would test uh, the urge of the, uh, you know, how elderly person can stay in power. So uh, it would be an interesting story, I think, in 2024. Uh, however, you can see that uh, for many years, uh, for 28 years in a row, we have the same person uh, who is left, in fact, in the very, very past, uh, in our agricultural uh, past. And, uh, you know, just uh, when uh, the world is striving to the future, to modernization, to information uh, era, we still have the same uh, person uh, inside the country. So in 2020, uh, as you know, uh, many uh, people, they went out to the street demanding the resignation of uh, Lukashenko, at least not the resignation, but in the beginning, a fair count of votes uh, that would be uh, cast uh, not uh, even for those who were not allowed to uh, participate in the election. So uh, we are together with Viktor Bobarika, uh, my team, some of the members that are present here also. Uh, we were able to collect uh, uh, together 600,000 signatures uh, to endorse us uh, to uh, become uh, presidential candidates and this was the record number of the signatures and it, we we didn't have anything to do during this period of time because you probably saw a big line of people uh, you know giving uh, their votes for our endorsement and uh, uh, Lukashenko he couldn't get uh, even a small portion of uh, this type of support so he decided uh, not to register us um, you know, he put uh, Viktor Bobarika in prison and deprived also uh, me of the chance to run for the president. So uh, the only person whom he allowed to register uh, was the wife of uh, also former opposition leader Sergei Tikhanovsky, uh, uh, who was registered. Uh, um, yeah, who was registered on behalf of Sergei, uh, you know, and uh, he thought that uh, um, yeah, it would be over for the campaign the same way that in 2015 it happened. And, uh, uh, and but, but he made a mistake. He made a mistake uh, because um, uh, three, uh, we decided to endorse Svetlana, we decided to help her to continue the campaign. And my wife, Veronica, and together with Maria Kolesnikova, uh, they created the female trio that also became quite famous, and uh, you probably know the rest of the story. Um, so uh, there are a couple of pictures that I would like to uh, share with you. Uh, you can see how many people uh, were on the streets, and you could only imagine that in the city of Minsk, where uh, 1.8 million inhabitants 
uh, 400,000 went out uh, to uh, protest against fraudulent elections in Belarus. And altogether uh, in the country, there were so many people. And uh, you have to understand, and this is what I meant, that uh, we are the majority, definitely. If in the city of 1.8 million uh, people, uh, 400,000 went out to the street uh, to demonstrate, it means that we are definitely the uh, majority. It's just a small group of people that were able to hold the power and uh, the reason why Lukashenko was able to keep the power was uh, also the support of Putin, uh, because uh, Putin uh, immediately recognized the results of fraudulent elections, gave uh, 1.5 billion US dollars to uh, Lukashenko, and uh, sent a very clear signal that if something went wrong, uh, then uh, he could uh, bring his paramilitary guys to the Republic of Belarus, and thus he made uh, our law enforcement uh, agencies uh, took a side of uh, Lukashenko, but not the people of uh, Belarus. So they subordinated uh, more to uh, Putin's regime rather than they uh, subordinate uh, the people of the Republic of Belarus. So uh, this is unfortunately the reality that we had. And um, as a matter of fact, you know, frankly speaking, uh, I will deviate a little bit from the uh, major, um, our presentation that, um, you know, now, um, previously, uh, Belarus army and Belarus law enforcement agencies, they uh, were, they didn't care whom to subordinate either to Lukashenko or to Putin, because even the army, they were thinking about being the so-called part of the second uh, army in the world. That's how uh, Russians, they represented themselves at the time. Uh, however, um, yeah, you know, just now, uh, when it's a complete failure of the Russian military uh, forces in Ukraine, um, it's uh, uh, Belarus uh, military under uh, big stress now because uh, uh, they admire the way, uh, like uh, the way Ukrainian army uh, is fighting against uh, Russian aggression, and uh, therefore uh, I think the uh, internal serious process are brewing inside law enforcement agencies uh, in uh, uh, Belarus too, including uh, the uh, army, the Belarus army. Um, so, but let me now uh, move to uh, our basic idea. So, uh, here is the uh, idea of uh, electing the National Council of the Republic of Belarus. And uh, as we see the opportunity with modern technologies, it is possible uh, to do. And uh, people finally uh, will be having an opportunity uh, to choose the representatives, their representatives, to the highest body uh, of uh, or the Republic of Belarus, the highest legitimate body that would be in the eyes of uh, uh, Belarus uh, people. So, um, yeah, just I do not want to uh, citate uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that all the governments uh, all the power should come from the people. Uh, probably you had that uh, uh, some uh, group of uh, Belarus individuals self-declared themselves as the uh, cabinet of ministers or whatever. Uh, but uh, we believe that uh, uh, all the governments and all the power should come from the people. The people are the only legitimate source of any power. Uh, none of the governments, none of the president cannot be self-proclaimed, and uh, that's, uh, for us, uh, it's an axiomic uh, um, assessment. So, uh, so we are thinking about electing 45 uh, uh, people uh, to the, uh, to our National Council, and as a matter of fact, there are a couple of precedents existing. Uh, the first of all, the Parliament of Tibet that are uh, elected uh, every four years, and uh, they have also uh, 46, I think, uh, uh, people in uh, their parliament, which is recognized by uh, 
uh, about 30 countries of the world. They have the groups of uh, parliamentarians inside uh, uh, the uh, parliaments of democratic countries that are dealing with the uh, parliament of Tibet. However, uh, the parliament of Tibet is elected only uh, through the uh, Tibetan citizens living overseas. Well, definitely they cannot arrange it inside uh, China. Uh, but in our case, because of the modern technology, I will say a couple of words a little bit later on. Uh, it's an opportunity, uh, again, to engage Belarusians in the political process. Because, uh, you know, if you are self-proclaimed, it's like a theater, you know, just uh, where uh, somebody uh, is composing a, a play and, uh, you know, some uh, actors are playing on the scene. However, uh, people are not involved, you know, just uh, they are uh, only witnessing the uh, events and uh, they are not engaged in the political process. But uh, we would like to bring the energy of 2020 uh, back to the political process uh, uh, of uh, Belarus. So uh, we think that um, uh, the creation of such a body uh, will make a legitimacy of this body uh, in the eyes of uh, Belarus people. And again, I would like to reiterate my statement that it could be just a transitional uh, instrument uh, to come to, uh, you know, to the real democratic society inside uh, our country. Uh, so uh, everyone can be registered, uh, everyone can be run and everyone can be registered. So the registration process is pretty simple. And we spoke with uh, Juan Guaido yesterday. They organized referendum uh, in Venezuela using modern technology. And even the service provider uh, probably would be the same uh, as was used in Venezuela. The service provider, uh, it's just a very simple process. You download an application uh, to your telephone. Uh, went through, go through the process verification, vote, and then you can delete it. So uh, it's absolutely, um, yeah, it's absolutely secure for uh, Belarusian people located inside uh, the country, uh, and uh, uh, it can be monitored. It will be monitored by uh, international observers. Uh, that, uh, in fact, Juan Guaido and several other opposition leaders from different countries in Latin America, Africa, and Asia agreed to uh, participate and to become uh, the uh, witnesses of the whole process, which could be, again, as I said, uh, a good precedent of creating a legitimate uh, body uh, in the situation when uh, it's not allowed to do it inside uh, the country. Okay, well, uh, we are planning to organize both uh, referendum and uh, elections, and we are planning to uh, put uh, several questions on online referendum uh, that uh, Belarus society is interested to discuss. I don't know about these slides, sorry. Uh, well, um, so as I uh, already said, uh, uh, there would be international observers and uh, the supervisory uh, board. So we would like uh, um, uh, to have uh, elections so transparent that nobody would uh, be having any doubts about the results of uh, these elections. So initiators and organizers, uh, you can see them, and we were able to organize uh, uh, several uh, Belarus Democratic Forums. The first one, in fact, took place in Warsaw uh, in May, and the second one took place in Berlin. And people, they um, started to feel enthusiastic themselves because every voice uh, in uh, this uh, forum could be had. And uh, that was very, very important because, as I said, for uh, many years, starting from 1996, uh, when the uh, last uh, freely 
elected and democratic elected, elected parliament were dissolved by uh, Lukashenko. So um, since uh, that time we didn't have the opportunity to talk to each other, to discuss openly questions, and we didn't have an opportunity to elect. Uh, which is again, I would like to um, uh, reiterate this idea that uh, the elections are taking place uh, everywhere. Yesterday I had a meeting in a uh, German Rotary Club and there was a president of the university, uh, Berlin Technical University, the largest uh, technical university in Germany, and we were discussing with him, uh, you know, just uh, the process and it appeared to be that uh, even deans were elected there. The president was newly elected, so the student council I elected. So on any um, uh, process, election is a very, very natural process to, um, you know, to uh, any democratic country, but uh, in Belarus we didn't have it. So, um, yeah, and uh, this is a very important step, I think, uh, uh, in the direction of democratic changes in the society. Now that's me, let me... That's uh, other guys, you know, just uh, who are behind it. That's our advisory board that is under making now, on the making. How can I get in touch? Vote online. So, thank you very much. I think that uh, uh, for now it's uh, enough. And uh, I and, uh, uh, you know, just uh, members of... Uh, uh, our team, uh, we will be happy to answer any questions. Uh, uh, if Thank you very much for this I presentation. Uh, uh, and now we'll have a chance to ask some questions about uh, reality, about facts. But let me change the language into Polish because it will be easier for us to interpret it in, in Polish, okay? Panie Ministrze, Panie Analityku, bardzo się cieszę, że macie plan. W istocie rzeczywistość po 2020 roku jest inna. Macie mocną reprezentację migracyjną. Jest mocna postać Swietłany Cichanowskiej. Elity związały się, zbudowały pewien fundament struktur politycznych na emigracji, ale realizm polityczny podpowiada, że to jest jednak daleko jeszcze do tego, żebyście faktycznie przejęli władzę w Białorusi. Co więcej, tego typu wybory po pierwsze muszą być reprezentatywne, po wtóre uznane przez naród, żeby ci, którzy wybrani, mogli rzeczywiście tą władzę potem w takiej czy innej formie przejąć. W związku z tym wydaje mi się, że bardzo istotne pytanie, jak geopolityka może wam pomóc, jak aktualna sytuacja polityczna, szczególnie związana z wojną pomiędzy Ukrainą a Rosją, wywołaną wojną przez Rosję, może wpłynąć na sytuację w Białorusi. Czy ta wojna w waszych rozważalnych scenariuszach może przyspieszyć ten proces odzyskiwania wolności przez Białoruś? You understand the question? Yes. Yeah. Tak, dzień dobry, mam na imię Rusłan Hazin, jestem politycznym aktywistem, uczestniczę tak samo w zalogie Walerii Cypkala, Dmitrii Bolkoniec i jeszcze dużo takich samych aktywistów, opozycjonerów, jakie musieli wyjechać po tych zdarzeniach, jakie odbyły się w 20 roku i po 9 stycznia w Białorusi. Co chodzi o odpowiedź na te pytania, na dzisiejszy czas mamy tylko możliwość zjednoczenia tej naszej opozycji, jaka musiała wyjechać z Białorusi i względu na te geopolityczne sytuacje, jaka teraz odbywa się na przykład w Ukrainie, mamy nadzieję, że reżim Putina, jaki podtrzymuje reżim Lukaszenki, bo reżim Lukaszenka to jest zależna taka rzecz i ona potrzebuje, potrzebuje tylko wsparcia od Kremla. I jeżeli Kreml nie zmoże zwyciężyć to na pewno w Ukrainie, to zaczną się jakieś procesy demokratyczne w Rosji. I to będzie możliwość w takim czasie e, 
Може, ми використати таку можливість на зміни в Білорусі, але ті зміни на... Зараз, ну, може, не... Барзу тяжко, щоб вони пішли в Білорусі без... Коли ми не бенжелі мали з єднашоном опозиція ту в Польсі, в Літві і в інших странах Унії Європейській. І потребуємо для того, щоб з'єднатися меч якомусь легітимному представництву, наприклад, як той парламент, о якому ми зараз говорили. Я то в певні розумієм, але в не меншому стопні Ważne jest pytanie, czy wasze założenia opierają się na realnym prawdopodobieństwie. Czy pan, panie ministrze, wierzy w to, że porażki na froncie ukraińskim spowodują powrót ruchów demokratycznych w Rosji? Czy to jest w ogóle możliwe? Większość światowych ekspertów twierdzi, że to raczej nie jest możliwe, że potencjał społeczeństwa obywatelskiego w Rosji jest zbyt nikły, żeby porażki wojenne spowodowały odbudowę społeczeństwa demokratycznego. Well, uh, definitely geopolitics uh, will uh, influence uh, seriously the situation, uh, internal situation inside Belarus. And not only inside Belarus, because uh, now uh, everybody realizes that uh, Russia has lost this war. It is Um, it, it, it won't be able to achieve any of the goals that was uh, put uh, before this uh, aggression against Ukraine. Uh, they wanted demilitarization, it wouldn't work, and uh, they wanted the so-called denazification, uh, having a Jewish president, which is quite bizarre. But in fact, what they wanted, they wanted at least to take half of the country of uh, Ukraine, and uh, uh, we can see that uh, they only take one uh, regional city, and it's unclear whether Russia will be able to keep this city at all. So um, uh, we do know historic precedents, and uh, the first one is when Russia lost the first Crimean War in 1853, if I'm not mistaken, uh, to France and to uh, Britain. And Turkey. Uh, yeah, because, uh, because of the technological inferiority. So, um, yeah, and uh, that it prompted, in fact, uh, serious reforms uh, inside uh, Russia. Then, uh, in uh, uh, 1905, they lost to Japan in Tsushima, and uh, the result of this uh, loss was the revolution that started from uh, 1905 until 1907, and uh, finally, Uh, yeah, the Tsar, uh, Nic Nicholas II, had to concede and start its Stalipin reforms at that time. In uh, 1917, you know that the lost in the First World War, uh, the result was the uh, February... Definitely the, not democratization. Yeah, yeah, but uh, the result was the uh, democratic revolution, the February Revolution, and then it was a coup uh, in uh, October. But however, uh, you know, uh, uh, the result was the loss of the power uh, of the uh, of Russian Tsar. So, um, uh, you know, just now, uh, In 2023, there will be a very interesting uh, situation in China. There will be election in China. And it's uncertain uh, for experts. It's real uncertain that uh, whether Xi Jinping uh, will be able to continue uh, having a power uh, because they still have election. They are a little bit strange, uh, you know, from the Soviet past, but it's still elections. Do you know how many uh, uh, members of the Communist Party in China they have nowadays? 100 million, something? Uh, yes, well, 95 uh, million. Uh, it means that about 15% of adult population. Uh, so, uh, anyway, you know, just in America also, when they adopted the first constitution, also about 20-25% were eligible to vote. And, you know, just uh, slaves were not eligible to vote, dependents were not uh, eligible to vote. So... Oh, let, let's come back... Yeah, okay, okay. For, 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 I mean, to the uh, crucial matter of about the potential of democratic civic society in Russia. Is it still enough strong just to handle... Reforms and changes. 
Yes, uh, well, I think uh, that, uh, you know, just now the internal processes, serious internal processes are happening, are brewing inside the uh, Russian leadership uh, because they uh, finally were able to see that the king is naked. So, and uh, the army that used to be claimed the second army in the world appeared to be uh, not at all, you know, just, and uh, so, um, uh, uh, I think that the biggest challenge for Putin would not be from uh, the uh, uh, democratic opposition, as you uh, consider the people that live now uh, in the West, but from the establishment, the same way as it happened in Belarus. Uh, you know, just when uh, two people from the establishment, me and Viktor Bobarika, you know, just we came up, it, it was very unexpectedly uh, for uh, the regime and uh, they uh, didn't have an idea what to do in uh, this situation. And I think uh, I, uh, Putin nowadays, if he would continue to run, he cannot predict uh, who from the establishment can challenge him in uh, 2024, and there will be definitely people that will uh, challenge him. And uh, it will change me, the it's, it's a crucial question, another question. Uh, does it, will it produce any change for Belarus? I mean, a change in Kremlin, establishment change, kind of coup d'etat, is able just to provoke changes in Minsk? That's a crucial question for you. Well, uh, we believe that the weakening uh, of uh, Putin's power, you know, can give more confidence to, uh, uh, to the Belarusian people and uh, less confidence to law enforcement that uh, serve, in fact, now both Lukashenko and Putin. Thank you. Dimitri, to you, question. The question to you, po polsku. Czy sądzisz, że Aleksander Łukaszenka zdecyduje się na zaangażowanie militarne w Ukrainie? I co to może spowodować z perspektywy zarówno establishmentu w Mińsku, jak i narodu białoruskiego? I think uh, for Lukashenko is uh, now uh, not good period uh, with uh, the war in Ukraine. He afraid uh, war and uh, he afraid uh, military. Also uh, the uh, situation when Russian army uh, located in Belarus. Uh, he afraid this case, and uh, I think there are now. Uh, now possibility that the Russian army go to Ukraine. I think because, because Lukashenko uh, uh, afraid uh, like... You believe he can do it and he will do it or not? No, no, no. I think no. no Why? No, no. Uh, because uh, I think it's uh, important for his life. Uh, he understands that the uh, Belarusian army uh, uh, don't want this war and population, people of citizens of Belarus is not uh, uh, support this um, Russian campaign, uh, Russian war, uh, because it's not empirical. Uh, Belarus people is not uh, imperial. Uh, Do you think that if such a decision is taken, it can cause the revolt within military complex? Maybe. Maybe and uh, and also uh, for continue another question, uh, I would I, I think that Lukashenko also afraid elections because many years in Belarus no any elections and uh, this case uh, of our idea for um, uh, elections to the national council is one of the. Uh, possibility to change situation in Belarus because now we have uh, no legitimate body uh, and uh, if we organize these elections I think we can change uh, situation inside country uh, because uh, if uh, we will uh, have a representative uh, uh, legitimate body I think uh, we will uh, Another uh, situation in Belarus also, and Lukashenko afraid elections uh, because um, he uh, understands that uh, he is not elected. Every time he told that he was elected, he um, he is a president. Uh, that all. Now you know today Lukashenko discuss about uh, liberalization in Belarus, uh, but is um, protests uh, um, not. Um, um, not uh, seriously, because now he won a new game with Europe, I think. He haven't money now, 
uh, he lose money after this war and uh, Russia is not uh, give him money now. There are no money from China, from Euro Union. And now he looking a possibility to, to change anything in Belarus. Uh, Valery, you do think that really the, just in, involving in the war, it can be kind of, kind of the red line for his regime? And it can, it can uh, cause rebellion in Belarus? Uh, in case he would enter the war? Well, I think uh, it will be, it would mean an over for him. You know, just, yeah, yeah, the game will be over. So, uh, we, in which uh, sense? I mean, uh, you know, just uh, because uh, Belarus army uh, can easily turn their weapons uh, towards me. Against him. Yeah, against him, you know, because, um, again, you know, just uh, it was a huge brainwash in Russia for seven years against Ukraine that we protect the uh, Russian-speaking population of eastern and uh, southern part of Ukraine. And, uh, you know, just we, uh, these are new Russia, they call these uh, uh, territories and so on and so forth. So, you know, just somehow the army is motivated, you know, uh, at least not for demilitarization, but at least to gain some territories from Ukraine. And that was the motivation for the Russian army. However, what motivation for Belarus army could be? Just to take a part of the Chernobyl zone, which we have uh, no idea what to do with our Chernobyl zone. You know, just it doesn't mean anything for Belarus. No rational reasons. Absolutely, no uh, reasons at all. Uh, just uh, um, uh, coffins uh, returning back to uh, Belarus. And this is the only reason. Proszę, to jest bardzo ciekawa konkluzja, że ta wojna z perspektywy Białorusi nie ma żadnego, żadnego uzasadnienia, żadnej racji. I rzeczywiście może spowodować bunt armii i bunt społeczny. Łukaszenka może się tego rzeczywiście bać. Ale pozostaje kolejne pytanie. Czy w istocie potencjał wolnościowy narodu białoruskiego po pacyfikacjach w 2020 roku jest na tyle duży, że do tej rebelii, skutecznej rebelii przeciwko dyktaturze może dojść? Jak sądzicie? Myślę, że teraz są taka mocna, represywna maszyna, jaka wszystkich ludzi utrzymuje w tym stosunku, w tym poziomie, żeby oni trzymali swoje myślenie, swoje życzenie do swobody, gdzieś tak jak kiedyś u nas, u nas mówili, na kuchni, tylko na kuchniach. Ale e, u, u ludzi to, co jeżeli ty wierzysz i znasz, że to jest czarne, a to jest białe, to niemożliwe zmienić w mózgu człowieka. I jeżeli on wie, że kiedyś on wychodził na te demonstracje e, w sierpniu, wrześniu, w październiku 20 roku, to u niego to, to zostało. I jeżeli nawet teraz Lukaszenka chce zrobić e, amnistię i wypuścić część więźniów politycznych, to będzie tylko tak, jak mówiliśmy, gra z z państwami na zachodzie, czyli jakaś mała gra, żeby pokazać dla swoich ludzi, że ja jestem tak trochę bardziej liberalny, ale wszyscy to już wiedzą i tylko, ja myślę, że ludzie tylko czekają na jakąś nową możliwość, żeby wyjść znów na protesty i przyjąć władzę. I trzeba przemyśleć te wszystkie pomyłki, jakie były zrobione Wtedy w sierpniu i już teraz, jak będzie taka możliwość, to wykorzystać tę możliwość. Szanowni Państwo, bardzo dziękujemy naszym przyjaciołom z Białorusi za udział w tym spotkaniu, za tą rozmowę. Nie ma chyba większych sojuszników dla wolnej Białorusi niż Polacy. My jesteśmy w tym konsekwentni i będziemy wspierali opozycję i emigrację białoruską. Mam nadzieję, że któregoś dnia rzeczywiście, jak mówił minister, przestanie być opozycją i przejmie władzę nad tym bratnim dla nas krajem. Jako, że temat jest bardzo skomplikowany i bardzo merytoryczny, ja myślę, że poproszę na koniec moich gości o to, żeby przygotowali publikację dla czytelników Rzeczpospolitej na temat scenariusza przejęcia władzy przez opozycję. Będziecie Państwo mogli ten tekst, ten tą opinię bądź wywiad mogli przeczytać w naszych mediach online'owych oraz na stronie Rzeczypospolitej. Raz jeszcze wszystkim dziękuję i 
zapraszam do kolejnych naszych transmisji z konferencji Forum Ekonomicznego w Karpaczu. Dziękuję.